May God indeed raise us, raise our hearts and our minds, set our hearts and our minds on him and on the ways of his kingdom. Amen. As I mentioned, we are studying the Gospel of Luke, looking at this longest of the Gospels, at least in terms of words, and combining Luke's uh, book of the uh, Luke's Gospel with the book of Acts, the longest uh, writing by any one person in the entire uh, Gospels, in the entire New Testament. Luke has a lot to say uh, that he's really trying to guide us in, and I pray that it can uh, grow and help us, help us make sense of it and help us even walk in it. But, you know, um, it's Father's Day. I need to talk a tiny bit about that. And I, I thought, you know, some years ago I was at a church and we had a lazy boy brought in for Father's Day, a lazy boy recliner. And we invited the dads to, uh, you know, to come in there and, and there was a little bit of a competition to see who was going to get to be, you know, was it going to be the most humble dad or was it going to be the most muscular dad or, or the, the longest serving dad who was going to be in there. And I I thought, wow, that, that's not, that's not going to work for us here. We, we want to, uh, we, as much as I want folks to be comfortable, I also want us to be walking and really focused in on where Jesus is coming from and what he wants us to know. So I, I pray this can be a blessing to us uh, dads and grandfathers and great-grandfathers. I, I think there's work for us as men of God still to do in this world. And really, for the, to include all of our sisters in Christ as well, there is work yet for us to do, or we would be in heaven with him. A reminder, I think, that Luke is trying to help people to know the story of Jesus. He's, he's careful. He's like a historian. He goes and talks to people. He talks to Mary. So we learn her song, which we looked at in last week's Bible study. We, he learns the song of Zechariah. He is the only one that has this story of the angels speaking because they, uh, when the shepherds came and told Mary, she would have told uh, Luke what it was that she experienced from them. That's one reason why I think you heard it. In there, that phrase that Mary took all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Ladies, you do such a great job of that and a great way of reminding all of us. And if it weren't for for Mary doing that and pondering them in her heart, we wouldn't have as rich a gospel as Luke provides because she shares that story with. And part of the reason I think it's so valuable for us to have that story captured, what Mary says the shepherds told her, what Mary took away from that whole experience, is that it then helps us trust God more. And this is a time when I think it is so very important for us to realize that we are called to trust God above all things, above all people. I don't know about you, but with midterm elections coming, I'm getting bombarded with emails and little flyers, and and politicians on the right and politicians on the left are all sending me these things saying, they will help me save America, or they want my help to save America. The last time I checked, outside of a backup system for a computer, the only saving of America or any people that can ever take place is by Jesus Christ. I don't think any politicians can do it, but I think that the Lord Jesus can. Mary was trying so very hard to help make sure that we understood that, and Luke then joins her as that partner to make sure this story gets across. And notice, what, part of what I'm talking about is that Luke puts all this in context. We hear the context of when it is that Jesus begins his ministry, when he's baptized. He mentions all the people that are ruling at that point. We hear and understand that back in when Jesus is first born, that there was this emperor by the name of Caesar Augustus who issued a decree for a census to be taken of the entire Roman world, right? We, we, just to, uh, to see that uh, in mind. But his goal was there earlier in Luke 2 when he told us that, that this idea, the census would be taken, the first one while Quirinius was governor, all of that was mentioned there. So why is Luke doing this? Well, I think one thing that perhaps can be helpful for us in that, one way we can try to understand it, is to realize for just a moment who Caesar Augustus was. So let me put up a picture here for him. This is uh, from a statue. And uh, I want you to, if you can, as you see this, this is one of the first emperors to declare a census. He did, if I remember correctly, three in his lifetime. This is, I believe, his second one that he ever called, but obviously the first when Quirinus was governor. 
And just let's picture for a moment Mary and Joseph up in Nazareth. They're trying the best they can to figure out how to make all of this manage and all, all this work, and they're wondering, wow, God promised we'd have the Messiah. You know, this is new. This has never happened to me. We've never done it this way before. You know, you can kind of picture some of the thoughts going through their minds. And then they hear this, hear ye, hear ye. Emperor Caesar Augustus has declared that you are to take part in our census. You must return to your hometowns, there to the place of your birth where you have property and where your heritage is from, and be registered. You can imagine them going, really? We're trying to get everything ready for this baby. Maybe at some point they remembered the prophecy, about the prophecy in Micah, to be born in Bethlehem. Maybe they had one of those, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. You can picture them as they arrive in Bethlehem, waiting in line, the Roman soldiers guarding the table with those there doing the whole census work. You can imagine someone in that line grumbling and complaining, I've had to travel three days for this. What is the whole point of this thing? Why do I have to do this? And you can imagine some Roman soldier overhearing this Jewish person complaining and saying, why? Because when Caesar Augustus pulls the strings, Every little puppet moves. And I can picture Mary whispering to Joseph, but when God pulls Caesar's strings, God gets his way. You see, politicians may try to use all their power in this world. They may want to pull all the strings and think they tell all of us what to do or where to go or how to save America or anything else. But in reality, it's God behind the scenes doing his work accomplishing his mission, setting the stage for his son to enter into this world. Maybe another way to notice that is how different is the way of Caesar versus the way of Jesus. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that one out of three people walking on the planet call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, if it wasn't for the fact that he gets mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, I doubt many of us would even know who Caesar Augustus was. That's because today, his empire, which was so powerful, which in the Colosseum uh, back in that day was a place where they entertained themselves by setting Christians on fire or letting them be attacked by gladiators or wild animals, where they crucified and uh, um, persecuted Christians for entertainment, that that Roman Empire is crumbled and gone. It's in ruins. It doesn't exist. And the very people that they persecuted, the people of God, the people of Jesus, the people who came glory to God in the highest and peace to his people, grace and peace to all. That very people who did not fight back, who instead prayed, who instead served, who instead were willing to do things God's way even when the world was exerting its power on them. That people turned the world upside down, transformed the, the, really the whole paradigm of what Western civilization was and would become, all because they followed in the ways of God and not in the way of Caesar. In fact, in the 1800s, one of the popes erected a cross, I think you see it there on the slide, erected this cross there in the Colosseum in memory of those Christians who had gone in peaceful submission even unto their deaths because they trusted in the higher emperor, the higher prince of peace, their Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sign that that empire of Rome is now conquered, but the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ reigns on. And I think it is a sign for us that God's kingdom power is greater and it is different than worldly power. God had worked through emperors and kings before, and he did it in the time of bringing Jesus into this world. He can still and does work in and through leaders today in all countries. But he wants to work in a way that is different than the way the world does. Remember what Jesus said? Peace I give you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Not with strings, not with demands, not with you do this and I'll do that, with all the quid pro quos and everything else involved. His kingdom ways are different. It's a way of love. It's a way of sacrifice. It's a way of service. 
How did he show his power? Well, as we go through the Gospel of Luke, we're going to see him move from this child who longs to be in his father's house to the man who would serve others, washing their feet, forgiving their sins, raising their dead, serving and giving his life as a ransom for many. We, too, are called to do the way of Jesus, to love. And I think perhaps it's worth it here on this Father's Day to remember that 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 love is what makes such an impact. That love and forgiveness, that love in strength, that love to always be there. And and, and I don't know, dads, I'll, I'll ask you to reflect on this for a few moments. It's pretty neat when your kid wants to do something you're doing, right? You're sawing some wood, and they want to be out there and be carpenter with you or work in the car and and all of that. But isn't it even more gratifying then when you start to see them living and doing the right thing even when they're not watching you? Or they've learned it so well, they're doing the right thing because they knew you were doing the right thing based on what Jesus was doing, and they do it on their own. Isn't it one of the most gratifying things of all when we see them step out living out the ways of God and the ways that we as earthly fathers tried to show them. And it is this way of love, this way of love that Jesus followed. I've got to be in his house. I've got to be with him. I want his blessing on me so I can do his kingdom work. And that's all of what is going on in here. And I I hope, first of all, we will soak in that. As Jesus was baptized, and you as his baptized love people, soak in that. Soak in what Jesus first received before he ever started a minute of ministry. You are my child, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. He says that to Jesus, and because of Jesus' perfect life, and because of his sacrificial death, because of his resurrection, we are adopted as God's children, and God the Heavenly Father says that of you. I love you. I'm pleased with you. I invite you to join then on the basis of that love, empowered by that love, to join my kingdom work. That is this way that he has in mind for us. And this peace that the angels spoke of to the shepherds that they then brought to Mary that she knew of, that we are then called to live in that good news and to live out that good news. Live in his love and then live it out as we show that peace to others, as we bring forward the grace that we've received, as we live not for our own glory or the glory of any earthly kingdom, but we live for the glory of God, sharing his good news, serving as Jesus served. I think it'll get clearer as we go more and more in through the Gospel of Luke, but I want to close with this thought. Jesus spent time in his Father's house. And it was wonderful. We can only imagine. I, I, I chuckle and I think, uh, you know, if you've ever lost your car keys, that's one thing. You'll search like crazy. But if you lose your kid, it goes to a whole other level. right? If, you ever, if you've ever lost your child, you, you know, in the grocery store or, or wherever it is, it just goes to a whole other level. You can picture Mary and Joseph searching every market, every nook and cranny they possibly could. Finally, at some point, they said, we better go to the temple and pray. We're not finding him. And right when they go in there to pray, there he is. There's Jesus in his father's house the safest place he could be, the most secure place he could be. Soaking in his love, sharing that love, talking with the teachers and and them with him, everyone amazed at what's happening here. And, And as they're in his house, as Jesus showed us that, he didn't just stay there. Imagine if Jesus at age 12, when this story happens in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, imagine he said, you know, Mom, Dad, go ahead home. I'm in my father's house. This is where I'm going to be for the rest of my days. I I never want to leave. No, Jesus did leave. He soaked in that love. He shared that love and God's wisdom with the teachers, but he knew that he needed to walk in that love and in that wisdom to do the Father's will, not just stay in the Father's house. I love time in the Father's house with all of you. I love time here in worship where we sing these songs, where we pray, where we are encouraged by God's word, and we encourage one another with that fellowship. But I also hope, friends, that we love going out and doing it, being that light, carrying the presence of Jesus and his goodness and grace, living it out all to his glory. In other words, that we take the things we ponder and treasure in our heart and we find ways to weave them into our living and doing. 
remind us again that this way of Jesus is different than the world's. It involves patience. It involves prayer, even for those who maybe are on the other side of a political eye or on the other side of a a neighborhood. It involves a welcome and it involves a serving of all. That's what Juneteenth was about, bringing that message. There's freedom now for those of you who have been enslaved. Freedom now for you to be equals and citizens in this nation. And that message needed to be carried by those who took it seriously. There is a message for you and I to carry as well of freedom, of hope that this world needs. And they think they're going to find it in the world's ways. But every time we give in and try to bring God's work about in the world's ways, we make God look bad. I'll talk more about that in, in, the, in the weeks to come. But this way of the Father is different. Not using power. If you want to use power, then do what Jesus said. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Let the world do the world's ways. We're going to do God's ways. God's ways of grace. God's ways of forgiveness. God's ways of serving, just like Jesus did. God's way of loving and sacrificing, just like Jesus did for us and for all the world. So treasure these things in your heart like Mary did. And may we also, like Mary, then take that news of the Father in our heart out and share it with all. To his glory, amen and amen.